You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil, Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Moyes. This is Lecture 14, given on the 12th of October, 1918. Yesterday we attempted to characterize the inner nature of an extraordinarily important fact in human evolution, doing so from a different point of view than on other occasions, a point of view which is, however, extraordinarily significant. Let us briefly call this to mind again. What I tried to show yesterday was that a kind of balance was achieved in the evolution of of European humanity by counterbalancing the event which should have happened in the year 666 with the other one which we call the event on Golgotha. I said that humanity is subject to a course of evolution which was, as it were, predestined for it by the powers that rule the world, powers in whom humanity had its origin. If one follows this human evolution in detail, one comes to see how the soul is able to find its place in whatever age it is born into. We are living in the fifth post-Atlantean age, which had its beginnings in the fifteenth century and will extend as far as the beginning of the fourth millennium or the end of the third millennium. Humanity is meant to develop the spiritual soul, as we call it. Painful and joyful events, ordeals for humanity, and events which we call a divine blessing. All the light and all the shadows we encounter in this age are meant to enlighten human beings more and more about themselves and their connection with the world. To take our place in full conscious awareness in the world, and with this to gain insights which in earlier times, and to this day, have been the subject of much fantasy, never seen in the right light, to gain this, doing so with self-discipline, as independent human individuals, with real control of the will, gained by self-education. This lies ahead as humanity's mission for this age. I'm going to read that sentence again to take our place in full conscious awareness in the world, and with this to gain insights which in earlier times and to this day have been the subject of much fantasy, never seen in the right light, to gain this, doing so with self-discipline, as independent human individuals, with real control of the will gained by self-education, this lies ahead, as humanity's mission for this age. Putting it in popular terms, we may say that it is the decision of the divine spirits with whom humanity has been connected from the very beginning, spirits who guided them from stage to stage. Other powers have gone against them, however, powers coming from two sides, which we usually call the Aramonic and the Luciferic powers. I also said that if we set up the hypothesis that the event on Golgotha had not taken place, if no Christ had decided to link his divine destiny with that of humanity on earth, what would then have happened? We cannot get to know history if we consider only what is in evidence for we will never arrive at a real proper view of events if we look only at the outer evidence. So if, for example, we were to be prevented by something from doing something which we would have done if it had not been for that something, perhaps being prevented from appearing somewhere or other tomorrow where we might have died in a railway accident, we cannot say that we give the right value to the event today by merely taking note of it. Seen by itself, The event could definitely be something utterly insignificant, merely stopping us from being in a place the next day where we would have died. We could not understand the event which prevented us, today, 
if we merely considered it in isolation. It is exactly because people pursue only a sense-perceptible, rational science, never asking what might have happened, that they do not gain insight into the true reality and value of such events. So, our question is, quote, if we were to assume that the Christ would not have linked his divine destiny with that of humanity in the event on Golgotha, what would then have happened? Close quote. Yesterday I told you that in 666, when certain measures would have become possible, human beings would have gone through a very different point in their evolution. Certain geniuses appearing among them would have gained a vast sum of great wisdom, slightly bizarre, but a vast sum of it. This wisdom would have been of enormous significance for humanity, because in the natural course of evolution human beings would evolve slowly toward such wisdom, as predestined for them by the divine spirits who are connected with their origin. They would have had to wait for it through millennia, as I said. They would in that case also gain it in a different way, because it would have to depend on their own efforts. The intention was, therefore, to preempt something which humanity would only be able to gain by their own effort over long, long periods of time. Humanity would have gained it when still immature. It is hardly possible to imagine today what the history of, in quotes, civilized humanity would have been if this event had happened. Humanity would have gained immature knowledge as if by instinct, but an instinct of genius. A tremendous chaos would have developed. And something else. People would have been stunned as all that knowledge was poured over them and their future evolution would have been cut short. They would have had the spiritual soul inoculated in the 7th century and not as predestined in the natural way from the 15th century onward but there would have been no further development into spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. People would have been extraordinarily perfect as human beings on earth, but their development to higher levels would have been taken away. This is hinted at so vividly. I am using the term temperament, terms temperament and vividly in all seriousness, and not as generally used in the book of Revelation when speaking of the beast or dragon. The figure 600, three score and six is given there, which has given much trouble to scholars. All of them have more or less guessed wrongly. Before that, to make sure that this did not happen and provide humanity with a counterweight, the event on Golgotha had to enter into human evolution when humanity was able to take in what did then enter with the coming of Christ Jesus. This is yet another point of view for forming the right opinion about the event on Golgotha and human evolution. It gives the whole of evolution on earth its proper meaning. As I have always been saying, to give just an indication of the true nature of the event on Golgotha, if an entity of the same rank as the human being on earth, which happened to be on another planet in our solar system, an entity not belonging to that other planet, were to come down to earth one day, many things on earth would of course be new to it. Suddenly arriving on earth, such an entity would not be able to understand all kinds of things. But there is one thing which it would understand, If you were to take such an entity, wherever it might have come from, to see Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper and the Christ among his disciples, this entity would have an inkling, in its own way, of the meaning of our earth. You might show it all the products of nature on earth, all the works of art on earth. The only thing it would understand would be that the destiny of the Christ is in some way interlinked with earth evolution. Yesterday I spoke of things arising purely from the spiritual point of view. I said the same for something else a week ago. This spiritual point of view is the only possible guide for present-day humanity, 
showing the way to facts that are important in life. Looking at events in the course of time with supersensible senses will show this contrast between the year of Christ Jesus' birth and the year 666. Let us look at external history with this in mind, however. Let us ask, quote, does that history confirm in any way that something did actually happen? Close quote. Well, since the academic world does not know much about these things, they have also never been very much recorded. But when one knows the truth, then it is indeed the case that one will also, in external history, find the events which can then provide information about things of the greatest importance. You see, certain things happen here in life. There is a spiritual world behind them. Someone who knows the situation will know how to relate the one thing or the other which happens to its spiritual background. Looking at the way humanity of more recent times has developed from the ancient Greco-Roman era, the evolution of Greek and Roman civilization, one will find many, many things puzzling if one considers only the outward aspects of history. But the inner connections make them clear to us. Take an event which is of little interest to the world at large, but which is, nevertheless, of extraordinary significance. Take the fact that in 529 the Emperor Justinian faced Greek schools of philosophy with legislation that they should cease to function, not permitting the schools, which were the glory of antiquity, to continue. Justinian's edict of 529 got rid of the scholarship which from time immemorial had influenced the Greek schools of philosophy, giving rise to an Anaxagoras, Heraclitus, later a Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. We can, of course, develop ideas from what history tells us as to why the Emperor Justinian swept the old knowledge away in Europe, as it were. But if we are honest in thinking about these things, we find that none of the details offered satisfy. We sense that unknown powers are at work in this. Strangely, this event coincided, not entirely, but historical facts, which may sometimes even be a few decades apart, do appear to go together when considered at a later time, with the expulsion of philosophers also from Edessa, which was done by Zeno the Isaurian. Learned people were thus driven out from some of the most important places in the world at that time. And these learned people, who still had the ancient knowledge insofar as it had not yet been influenced by Christianity, this was in the 5th and 6th centuries of the Christian era, had to emigrate. They emigrated to Persia and established the academy of Gandhi Shapur. Even philosophers do not refer much to this academy, yet one must be aware of the nature of Gandhi Shapur, which was established by such ancient scholars as remained, or one will have no idea of the whole evolution of humanity in more recent times. For the ancient wisdom of the sages, who had been driven out by Justinian and Zeno the Asarian, provided the basis for tremendously important teaching which was given to the students in Gandhi Shapur in the 7th century. It was there that Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, was translated. And the strange thing which happened was this. Aristotle, otherwise his work would probably have been lost completely, was first translated into Syrian in Edessa by the scholars who had been driven out by Zeno the Isaurian. The translation into Syrian was taken to Gandhi Shapur, where it was then translated into Arabic. Something rather strange may be found in this translation of Aristotle from Greek to Arabic via Syrian. Anyone who gains some insight into the changes which thoughts undergo when translated properly from one language into another, when one attempts to translate them, will be able to understand that there may have been something, well, let me put it hypothetically, like intention to take not the Greek Aristotle, but the Aristotle which had gone through Syrian to Arabic. The Arab soul, 
a strange soul at that time, combined great acuity of thought with something that had an element of fantasy to it, though it was along logical lines and would rise even to the level of vision. And with the translation of Aristotle, a basis was created of Aristotelian concepts seen in the light of that Arab soul. And a mighty philosophy of life developed at Gandhi Shapur in the light of this particular way of seeing things. It was at Gandhi Shapur that the event to which I was referring happened in the seventh century. The event to which I was referring was not out of the ordinary, not even something that did not exist already on earth. At Gandhi Shapur they were indeed teaching what I spoke of yesterday taken in its essence the greatest contrast one can imagine to everything that has evolved from the event on Golgotha. The learned people at Gandhi Shapur had a particular aim. This was, and it was exactly what I told you yesterday and have also just referred to, a comprehensive body of knowledge which was intended to replace the efforts of the spiritual soul. It would have made human beings into nothing but earthly creatures, closing them off from the evolution which man's creators intended for him, with spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. Anyone who has an idea of the wisdom of Gandhi Shapur will consider it to be extremely dangerous for humanity, but at the same time also a tremendous phenomenon. The intention was to flood the whole known civilized world of that time, everywhere in Asia and Europe, with this scholarly knowledge. A beginning was made. But the knowledge that was to flow from Gandhi Shapur was held back, in a way, by spiritual powers which retard, powers which were, after all, connected, in spite of also being a kind of opposite, with the elements that were influenced by the Christ impulse. The wisdom that was to flow from Gandhi Shapur was, in the first place, blunted by the coming of Muhammad. He taught a fairly imaginative religion, particularly in the areas where the Gnostic wisdom of Gandhi Shapur was meant to be taught, taking the ground away, as it were, from under the feet of Gandhi Shapur wisdom. He skimmed off the cream, as it were, and when the wisdom of Gandhi Shapur came sailing along, it could not get through the things done by Muhammad. This may be seen as the wisdom of world history. We will also only know Islam properly when apart from other things we know that Islam was destined to blunt the Gnostic wisdom coming from Gandhi Shapur, taking away the great Aramanic powers of temptation which would otherwise have been addressed to humanity. The wisdom of Gandhi Shapur has not completely disappeared. To understand what happened in connection with the Gnostic movement of Gandhi Shapur, we must carefully follow developments from the 7th century to the present day. The things which the great teacher there, his name has remained unknown, but he was the greatest opponent of Christ Jesus, taught his students have been lost, but something else has been achieved. It does, however, need careful study to perceive it. We may ask, quote, What has really led to modern natural science, this peculiar natural scientific way of thinking? Close quote. What I am going to say now is actually not unknown to careful historians. The present day natural scientific way of thinking, I characterized it for you yesterday, has not developed by something evolving in a straight line from Christianity. We may say that in reality it has nothing at all to do with Christianity. We can trace, step by step, from decade to decade, how Gnostic Gandhi Shapur wisdom, even if blunted, spread via southern Europe and Africa to Spain, France and England, and then across the continent, especially via the monasteries. And we see how the supersensible was driven out and only the sensible retained, the tendency, as it were, the intention. Natural scientific thinking in the Western world thus arose from the blunted Gnostic wisdom of Gandhi Shapur. 
It is particularly interesting to study how the Gnostic wisdom of Gandhi Shapur flowed into Roger Bacon, not Francis Bacon, Baron Verulam, but Roger Bacon, who as a monk was not greatly respected by his colleagues. People know so little today of the origins of things that influence their souls. They believe their thinking to be natural scientific and without bias when it has actually come from the academy of Gandhi Shapur. Thus it is not the case that knowledge gained from spiritual vision cannot be substantiated. We must merely use the right method so that we can also show in life, as we experience it, how something gathered from the spiritual realm has really happened. Studies like this will be of tremendous importance for the immediate future of humanity. For humanity will have to get orientation about its past if it wants to find a way out of today's confusion, the chaos of recent years. Today people tend to look at everything from the natural scientific point of view, and this does not really have anything to do with Christianity as such. It is the outcome arising from preconditions which I have been characterizing. We therefore do truly have these two streams, two forces in evolving Western civilization. On the one hand, the Christian stream, on the other, the element which has so profoundly influenced Western thinking, an element we can study by looking at the cultural life in medieval times. The cultural life of the Middle Ages is studied in a rather biased way, but go and look at the work of the painters, which shows how medieval scholastics behaved toward Arab philosophers. See how in the Western Christian tradition they showed the scholastic who stands there with his Christian teaching and with this teaching made occasion to trample those Arab scholars underfoot. Again and again this passionate theme, using the powers of the Christ to trample the Arab scholars underfoot. See this in the paintings produced under the influence of Christian tradition in the West and realize that it is all the passion of the Middle Ages which lives in those paintings to oppose with the Christian ethos the elements which originally arose from the opposition to the Christ at the Academy of Gandhi Shapur, oppose Arab scholarship coming across to Europe. Those who know the situation will see echoes of what I have been telling you about in Maimonides, Rambam, Avicenna, and everywhere. Consider, man was intended, with the mystery on Golgotha, to help him in this, to find the spiritual soul out of his own individual nature, and then ascend further to spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. At that time, however, the intention was to give him direct revelation out of the genius of Gnostic scholarship, of the wisdom which he would otherwise have to find by his own individual effort and skill, which was the intention of the divine spirits who determined his fate, Christ Jesus being one of those these spirits. This still lived in the thoughts of those who, like Averroes, still had the Gnostic wisdom of Gandhi Shapur, even if it had been blunted. Reading the foolish notes referring to Averroes that appear in modern textbooks and are out of context, how is one to understand why Averroes, Andalusian, polymath of Arab extraction, said, quote, When we die, only the soul's substance flows out into general spirituality. Human beings have no personal individuality. But everything the individual has by way of soul is but mirroring the one universal soul. Close quote. Why did Averroes say this? Because it is a branch of the wisdom coming from Gandhi Shapur, which has made it clear to people not that every individual was to d develop the spiritual soul, but that the wisdom of the spiritual soul was to be given to them as a revelation from above. It would have been an aramonic revelation. Humanity would in that case truly have had a spiritual soul with monistic content and individual minds would essentially have been but maya. 
Everything that lives in Western civilization becomes clear when we look at things from a spiritual point of view. We do, however, have to ask ourselves over and over again, quote, how can this development leading to the spiritual soul take place? Close quote. It will, after all, have to take place. Secondly, we must ask, quote, what prevents people today from turning to spiritual science, which alone can show the way to the spiritual soul? Close quote. Yesterday I told you that the natural science, which modern humanity is so proud of, really leads to ideas which do not reflect nature, but contain a ghost. The things people know about nature are not the truth of nature, but a ghost, relating to real nature the way a ghost does to something that is absolutely real. It is merely that scientists do not know that theirs is a ghostly knowledge, that their knowledge of the human being is not of homo, but of homunculus, the kind of progress in human evolution which started in the 15th century and will continue to the end of the third millennium, will be such that people will have to realize more and more what they are gaining with insight into nature, for instance, how they come closer to reality with this insight into nature. People will have to seek insight. They will have to avoid the obstacles they meet when they develop their desire for insight. The major obstacles, we have already characterized them from one particular point of view, and we'll bring them back to mind now, arise because in the age of natural science, which is the offspring of Gandhi Shapur Academy, people gain only ghostly knowledge, for there is nothing spiritual in their ideas of nature. We might ask, quote, why do human beings do this in this day and age, close quote? because it will give us an idea of what we have to overcome. Why do human beings unconsciously want to have a ghostly knowledge of nature and are actually proud and in high spirits with their ghostly knowledge of nature? Why? Well, the moment one realizes fully that this knowledge of nature gives us only a specter of nature, one also feels the need to penetrate to the true reality that is behind the specter. One then wants to have the reality of nature. We might also characterize our natural scientific philosophy from the following point of view. We might say, quote, This natural scientific philosophy comes with ghostly ideas, settles down with them, thinking that these were ideas about real nature. And one then develops all kinds of concepts, atoms, molecules, and so on, which, as you know, simply do not exist but our pure invention. Invents all kinds of laws, such as the conservation of energy, conservation of matter, which do not actually exist. Close quote. People look for all kinds of hypothetical aspects behind something which does not exist, behind their ideas, which are ghosts acting according to ghostly laws. Why do they do this? Well, because deep down the fear I mentioned earlier makes itself felt. It is just that people do not know they have this fear, seeing that it is unconscious. I might also call it cowardice. For what would happen if people had the courage to confess, quote, you want a concept of nature and not a ghost nature, you must therefore penetrate to the reality, close quote. Then you won't find atoms, nor molecules, nor concepts developed by Ostwald and, or by Haeckel. You will find Ahriman and his hordes. Things get spiritual then. Someone who truly penetrates to reality with a proper science of nature will find Ahriman. But that is what people are afraid of. For they think they will fall into the abyss when they find the spirit where they were merely looking for matter which in fact does not exist. Initially the spirit shows itself which one cannot worship but against which one must protect oneself. One has to be fully clear in one's mind about this spirit. In the sculptured group next door there is nothing arbitrary about putting the Christ together with Araman and Lucifer. 
The composition reflects the most profound vital issues of our time, and humanity must become aware of such things. Our knowledge of nature is ghostly, has to be ghostly for as long as people do not have the courage to look for the spiritual aspect. There they will, however, find Araman. Our knowledge of the soul does not give us the true soul, but merely an image of it. Essentially, the psychology taught at academies and universities today gives merely an image of the soul. And this image blinds us to the real soul. For if one were to continue one's investigations in the same way as that which has produced the image, it would be Lucifer who appeared. That is the next spiritual element which one would find. Yes, anyone who is truly able to penetrate through the historically blunted wisdom which still remains of what was to be established in Gandhi Shapur will find that this approach provides very exact knowledge of Lucifer and Araman. But it was intended to lead to Lucifer and Araman only and not to the guidance which Christ Jesus gives to humanity. The medieval scholastics who wanted to tread the Arab scholars underfoot did have a feeling for this, always finding themselves in this situation, and they felt it because it is connected with humanity's most profound developmental impulses. The wisdom which was to have been revealed to humanity with the help of Araman, instead of being gained by people's own efforts through centuries, would have been most dangerous. Humanity is in the process of gaining this wisdom, which has to do with three things, through the spiritual soul today. But at that time, in the seventh century, it was to come to them in the way I have indicated. This wisdom relates to three things. It is not that humanity is meant to gain it, but they are meant to do so under the guidance of the Christ impulse. The three things are, firstly, the nature of birth and death. We have spoke, often spoken of this, and you know from the way in which we have spoken of birth and death that human beings can only master them with supersensible insights. As the human being is born and as he dies, the supersensible shines into the sense perceptible world. Birth and death continue to be riddles for those who would only grasp them outwardly through the senses, for they are not sense perceptible phenomena. The sense-perceptible phenomena of birth and death are unreal. In reality, these are supersensible events. When one attempts to explore the secrets of birth and death supersensibly, using real observation, secondary phenomena will appear to the inquiring mind. Above all, one comes to see that in life here in the sense-perceptible world, one has only an apparent inner life. In the Western world, people have refused to accept this truth for centuries. You can follow the history of this refusal in my book titled The Case for Anthroposophy, where I discuss this right at the beginning. I had to be careful how I put things, however, for one cannot yet present these things to the outside world. People find them paradoxical. You know very well that the words of Descartes, which are still ascribed to Augustine, are known throughout the Western world, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I exist. People believed that they could grasp the soul's reality by thinking. The words should really be different if one wanted to speak of the truth of man living in the sense-perceptible world. We would have to say, quote, I think, therefore I do not exist, close quote. For we cease to exist the moment we start just to think, when we develop inner thinking only. What is then within us? A highly complex phenomenon. But we will get a clear idea of it today and tomorrow. Let us assume that this, there's a figure, is human life. And here is what thinking human being, forming ideas, inwardly experiences throughout life. This would then be merely an, ap an apparent structure, really like a tube running from birth to death. For the reality came before this, before birth, or let us say conception. There we are real in the spiritual world, in the supersensible. 
And at the border, where we enter into the sense-perceptible world, only an image is allowed to pass through. We are but an image of our life before birth or conception. The truth is not that something which lives now is speaking as I speak to you, but only images which have been allowed to come through. In truth, it is something which has been in the spiritual world which still speaks today. We are not eternal because we endure, but because today we still are what we have in truth been before birth or conception. This speaks into our present time. By entering into our bodily nature, we have really become an image of our essential nature for the period of a life on earth. I think, therefore I do not exist. From Augustine to Descartes, philosophers have obscured this profound truth. We shall never fathom the secrets of birth and death in such darkness. For you ask, quote, when did the soul begin, close quote, at birth? Quote, when does it cease, close quote, at death? Knowing supersensible truth, we should put the question differently. Quote, when did the soul cease to unfold its life as soul? Close quote. When we were born or conceived. Quote, when will it start to unfold its life as a supersensible entity again? Close quote. When we die. Here on earth we interrupt it, so that not only the supersensible is active in our life, and will be able to take in the achievements of the sense-perceptible world, taking them with us in our life as a whole. This is no rapturous asceticism, but the fact that earth is an absolute necessity in human life as a whole. Our life on earth has great significance exactly because of this, and is apparently material because our actual human life as a supersensible human being ceases as we enter into life on earth, and starts again as we continue to live, having gone through death. The secrets of birth and death only begin to reveal themselves when we know ourselves as supersensible entities, and know that we are but an image of what we were before birth, and will be as a sole entity after death. But we must have the courage to look and see what there is in us. If that figure is merely a hollow tube, an image, we must have the courage to say to ourselves, quote, let us not be blinded by the image, but face up to Lucifer in our search for insight. It takes courage, inner courage, to gather insight which is truly fruitful for life. Close quote. This is something to be emphasized again and again. So, the one thing is the knowledge which relates to birth and death. The second knowledge relates to our biography. We see our relationship as a soul to the body in the wrong light, justifiably so, for the reasons which you will find in my title, Occult Science and Outline. Human beings, therefore, also see their biography in the wrong light. Their idea of it matches the image of Father Rhein, which I presented a few days ago. You'll remember how I spoke of the image. Someone stands there, looks down from the bridge in Basel and says, quote, I see the old Rhine, close quote, the old Rhine. Oh yes, I then ask, quote, what is this old Rhine? The water flowing down there is definitely not old. In a few hours it will be a long way downstream, and in a few days somewhere in the wide ocean it definitely is not old. And this old Rhine you speak of does not seem to me to be the mere channel which extends from the Swiss mountains to the North Sea. Close quote. So, what is Father Rhein, the old Rhein, of which people speak so often? In material terms, it is nothing. Nothing of substance remains when you take the Father Rhein concept. Nor does anything remain in truth if you take your own bodily nature. This body of yours is a flowing river. Destruction, renewal of the fluids, nothing remains but the form which is a product of the spirit. Into this form pours something that appears to have substance, pours in, is destroyed, just like the water in Father Rhein. What external maya 
illusion is actually creating prevents us from seeing the river of steady dissolution and renewal which is the truth with regard to external life in the senses. We are looking at something which is said to have been born, lumps of flesh with blood and bones in them, which is meant to grow and increase in size until fully grown and then stays like that until death. That is more or less the same idea as when we think of Father Rhein as a piece of water, which of course does not exist, extending from the Swiss mountains to the North Sea. And, what is more, see it as a quiet piece of water lying in its riverbed. That is how we imagine the human body. It is in constant flow, but we think that it is something static. One cannot even find the right word for it, between birth and death. If we were to see ourselves as we really are, it would be as being in constant flow, and we'd be quite unable to get the idea that this has anything to do with our true nature, for it is in continuous flow. If we were able to see what is behind the constant process of dissolution and renewal, the powers behind it, we would have a science of medicine, the spiritual medical science, which would indeed be different in form from the medical science which we have today. You would not be able to say of that science of medicine, quote, ah, well, it is used to cure diseases, close quote. Diseases are not cured because there can be no question of curing diseases the way people want this to be done today. With a genuine spiritual medicine, one can only maintain the totality of health-giving powers. A true medicine would consist in organizing life in such a way that human beings govern the powers which effect constant elimination, dissolution, and renewal. One would then need no pharmaceutical products, with individuals not only knowing how to apply this in their own case, but living together with others in such a way that this could find its way to the whole human race. I have spoken of this before. It is the second thing. The third thing connected with this insight is a true science of nature. What is a true science of nature? I have stressed on several occasions that occult science does not go against natural science the way it is today, but one knows that this natural science does present nature not as she is but as a ghost. It is not a matter of fighting that ghost. Our human constitution being what it is, we have to accept the ghost. There is no question, I referred to this when speaking of the philosopher Richard Valla yesterday, of thinking up a poison, even if a poison for philosophy, a philosophical and not a physical poison, to rid the world of all the people who may be thinking in a natural scientific way. It is a matter exactly of finding out where they are right. We should say to natural scientists, quote, if you were to say that you are using the right methods of investigation, we would fully agree. But you also have to admit that using these methods, which are the right ones for natural science, you arrive merely at ideas of a specter of nature and not its reality. Close quote. We have to see through it, however. It is indeed the task we are set for the age of the spiritual soul that we see through things as they really are. The natural scientist will say, quote, Yes, I have various reasons why I will not have made my knowledge of nature into a ghost. Close quote. The spiritual scientist will have to reply, quote, But you are quite right to have a ghostly nature of knowledge you would be wrong to look for any natural substance outside the specter. You are only right when you look for all kinds of aramonic elements behind the specter, when you look for something spiritual behind it. But you do right in looking for ghostly knowledge. Close quote. The things I told you about the human being's bodily nature do indeed have very much a ghostly character and someone who penetrates nature from a higher point of view, considers a very different natural phenomenon to be true and not deceptive than the robust natural phenomena which are normally presented to us. 
The strange thing, I will also speak of this tomorrow, is that in spite of it all, the world will everywhere point firmly to the right thing at one point or another. A pointer to the right thing will be found somewhere or other when one wants to know what to think of the reality of the natural phenomena which surround our senses. What should we really consider? Is there something in nature herself that will enlighten us? Yes, there is. The rainbow, for example. The rainbow is the perfect image of a natural phenomenon. Just think, you know this yourself, if you were to get up to where the rainbow is, you would be able to walk straight through it, for it is merely the result of certain processes coming together. All natural processes are as spectral as the rainbow, are ghosts just like the rainbow. We merely do not notice this. They are not what they are to the eye or the ear or the other senses, but a coming together of other processes, and these are non-physical. We put our feet down on what we think is solid matter. In reality, it is merely something we perceive as a power or force, just like the rainbow. And when we think we are putting our feet on solid ground, it is Araman who sends up the power or force from below. As soon as we go beyond the merely spectral or ghostly aspect of natural phenomena, we come upon things of the spirit. This means that all exploration looking for crude matter is fairly senseless. Once humanity gives up the search for crude matter as the basis of nature, and they will do so before the fourth millennium, they will arrive at something completely different. They will find rhythms everywhere in nature, rhythmic systems or orders. These exist, but are generally laughed at in the materialistic science of today. We have created an image of these rhythmic orders in the seven pillars, in the whole configuration of our building here. But you also find it everywhere in the natural world. One leaf rhythmically follows another in the plant. Petals show rhythm in their arrangement. All is rhythm. Temperatures rise rhythmically when you are sick and then go down again. All life has rhythm. To penetrate the rhythms of nature, that will be a true science of nature. Penetrating the rhythms of nature also induces us to make use of rhythms in technology. It is to be the aim of future technology to generate harmonious waves or oscillations on a small scale and then transfer them to the large scale. This means that simple harmonization makes it possible to do tremendous work. Tomorrow I am going to show you in detail why it is truly wise in the Christian world order, which in this sense is the wise divine world order, to let humanity mature through centuries for the insights to which I have been referring. Whereas the Ac Academy of Gandhi Shapur intended simply to throw them at people, humanity must strive for something else if these insights are to come to them. These insights must only come for humanity when in the first place and together with evolution toward such insights there is a completely selfless social order for the third point widespread among humanity. You cannot develop rhythmical technology without bringing more disaster upon humanity unless a selfless social order is striven for at the same time. An egotistical humanity would see disastrous consequences from developing rhythmic technology. It also is not possible to provide human beings without further ado with the second power I mentioned, which is identical with human healing powers. Powers in evidence where one sees processes of dissolution and renewal, elimination and uptake. This power cannot simply be given to humanity, as I have said from other points of view, unless one does at the same time breed absolute conscientiousness in human beings, when it comes to their attitude not only to things that are outwardly perceptible, but also to things that are not outwardly perceptible. When human beings deny themselves not only things that are outwardly visible, but follow a certain rule of conscience, and deny themselves also things that are not outwardly visible, thinking and feeling, this power is hidden from us, 
because we see the stream of life from birth to death as a rigid body. If we were to gain insight into and learn to control this power, we would be capable of doing enormous harm unless the power were to develop in the light of absolute conscientiousness also with regard to things not evident to the senses. The third thing would be corresponding to my first point, insight into the secrets of birth and death. Yes, these secrets of birth and death require that human beings first go through a certain state of maturity. They require that human beings can face Araman and Lucifer in full awareness. Anyone fully able to work out what is meant with this first point will know the following, which I am now going to consider in conclusion. More details will follow tomorrow. Such a person knows that one can gain knowledge of nature that is entirely spectral, not knowing that it is merely the ghost of knowledge. It helps us, it really does, for we do not then face the danger of getting close to Araman. You can make Araman invisible, but in that case you have to gain insights into nature merely in the present-day sense, and that is untrue. It makes a good barrier against Araman to stick with insight into nature that is untrue. You merely have a choice between wanting the truth, in which case you will also have to acquaint yourself with supersensible Aramanic influences in the world, or taking untruth, breed untruth. Say, quote, the ghostly knowledge of nature gives us real nature, close quote. Well and good. In that case, you stay with the things that suit Araman. Araman wants the, the lie. He lives on it. And he'll manage to live particularly well on this hidden lie. There's nothing he likes better than to have this lie prevail. The view being, ghostly knowledge of nature is real knowledge of nature. I have again spoken of something which is but a maya of what exists in the supersensible realm. Referring to it, as the image that was allowed to pass through. You then also have the choice. You can penetrate to the supersensible. Good. In that case, you must also come face to face, supersensibly, of course, with Lucifer. Or you stay with untruth and consider the maya of the psyche to be reality. You will, however, never find out about birth and death in that case and about immortality since you'll not be considering the soul, which is immortal, but just a mere image. This is what I wanted to speak about today. Tomorrow we'll take it further. It is an important thought. On earth human beings have the option now, in the age of the spiritual soul, to strive for the truth. They must then also face the spiritual sphere with courage. Or they may choose to avoid the spiritual in which case they can stay with the illusion, the non-truth. The Academy of Gandhi Shapur wanted to spare people the effort of seeking the truth, wanted to spare them the effort of further development, wanted to reveal to them what had been revealed to them themselves in Aramanic ways. The last shadow, the ghost of the Academy of Gandhi Shapur, is the natural scientific illusion of today. The aim of the academy was to make man into a wholly earthly being. It was overcome in its endeavors by something which was made part of humanity even before it came to exist, the meaning on Golgotha. More of this tomorrow. The end of lecture 14 of 15 lectures. There's one more left.